Greetings. We are sitting in court six of the Blackfriars Crown Court. I have got with me... Hi, Van Zecker. Nice to meet you, Van Zecker. So how does it feel to sit in the courtroom? Feels a bit strange, to be honest. Can't say I ever expected I'd be on this side. Uh... <laughs> me neither. So courtrooms, tell us about you, because I know you've got a connection to courtrooms. Yeah, um, so I'm actually a law graduate, uh, funnily enough, um, from the University of Surrey. Um, didn't go into law proper, um, but I was lucky enough to have some experience, particularly around legal aid as part of my degree. Um, and I think I definitely saw a lot of injustice as part of that. Um, a lot of people who couldn't get the legal help um, that they really needed um, simply because they didn't have the money, um, which was possibly one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever had to see on a long term basis. Um, I haven't gone into law proper, um, obviously, uh, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I definitely think I've carried that kind of long term interest and genuine commitment to justice and to fairness, which hopefully is, is reflected in the other things that, that I do now. And you are going to tell us a bit about the things that you do, but I'm wondering, you studied law and obviously you, you witnessed some of the injustices that people facing legal proceedings face, but what about your, in your own life? Did you have any experiences as a young woman or as a child of injustice? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think it's unavoidable as, you know, a young black woman growing up in this country, particularly in kind of the, the late 90s, early 2000s. Like, I grew up in kind of white suburbia in a tiny little town called Felix So that most people have probably never heard of. Um, and yeah, it was, it really shaped me actually in ways I really didn't appreciate until relatively recently now as a sort of 28 year old woman. Um, that's that sense of otherness that I felt all the time trying to be myself in these spaces that fundamentally were telling me I wasn't good enough that I didn't you know I didn't you know meet white beauty standards I was keenly aware of that as a child from a very very young age and I just knew that I was different you know I had different culture cultures that I, I just really did struggle for a long time with learning to, to love myself and, and love the cultures that I'm from um, and that impacted me for, for a really long time. And I've written about it. Um, and I do think that fundamentally, like, that will impact me forever. And I can probably never say that I can fully untangle the real kind of difficulties and that, that real sense of ultimately self-hatred and feeling like you're not good enough, um, even as an adult, which is ultimately the, that's the harsh reality of racism is it really infects and, and affects people inside as well. And that all stems simply from being the fact that you're a young woman of mixed African and Asian heritage and you were basically not white. Yeah, it's, it's completely that. And all my siblings, again, had a very similar experience um, as well. And, and, and I've had many people reach out to me from similar backgrounds who've also said, you know, this was me. Like, I also really felt this. Well, I totally resonate with you. Yeah. <laughs> that was me like 30 years before. <laughs> so. You took all your experiences and you went into law, but you've done more than simply, well, I say simply, but being a lawyer, you've actually taken it wider. Do you want to tell us a bit about how you've used your experiences and your legal experiences to, I should say, combat racism? Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> so obviously I did a law degree um, and did my placement year, um, chose not to go into law proper and my immigrant parents were probably not that happy about that. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I'm just going to set up a website and a blog. Um, <laughs> so essentially, yeah, like that, that's one of the things that I've done and, and that I'm really proud of um, is having set up uh, Naked Politics, which is my online platform to get young people interested in politics, um, particularly um, black and minority ethnic young people, black people as well. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really about empowering young people, giving them a voice um, in a political climate that largely doesn't care about them and doesn't encourage them to participate. Um, so that's one of the things I'm really, really proud of is, is amplifying their voices and essentially telling them like your opinion does matter. You know, we need them to be a part of our democracy. We need them to be a part of, of, of civic society, right? We need to know what the opinions of young people are and they should be reflected in, in our democracy and, and in our society. Um, and as well as that, I've, I've written a lot uh, as a freelance writer about race. So you're also a writer? Yes, <laughs> so I'm also a writer as well um, and I've written an awful lot about race, um, particularly this year obviously with the kind of focus moving a lot towards um, the Black Lives Matter movement and the impact that that has had as well 
Um, I've written a lot about my own personal experiences, but increasingly I'm trying to, to tell other people's stories too, which I think ultimately is what a good journalist does. Um, so that's kind of a bit about, about me and, and, and that journey. So with Naked Politics, you started that quite a number of years ago before this recent Black Lives Matter and Movement for Black Lives. When, when exactly did you start it? So I started it in 2015, which was also the same summer that I graduated. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you went straight in. Yeah. Uh, so I went straight into it. For me, it was very obvious that there was this huge gap there in terms of what there is for young people. 2015 was also an election year. Um, and did you feel that, like, at the time, you were obviously a young, much younger person. You know, you're still a young person now, but, <laughs> you know, that, that you, you could see amongst your peers and amongst yourself that there was an inaccessibility to, to a kind of understanding politics and the legal system, etc. Yeah, and I do see a lot of parallels, actually, between the way... Because it took me a long time as a law student to understand how to read, like, a case or anything. And I see very much the same thing in politics. It's full of all this jargon. It's full of all this stuff that's overly complicated. You know, when you watch a debate in the House of Commons, the average layperson that watches it, they're going to have no idea what's going on. There's a guy coming in with a mace or something. It's all very, like... It's just so archaic, and I, I found that, honestly, like very exhausting, because for me, politics is about people, and politics is about change, and politics is about our society. It's not about, like, you know, traditions, and all that stuff can be nice, but, you know, all that kind of jargonistic, legalistic language, those are, fundamentally, I see those as barriers. They're barriers to people understanding things that are actually hugely important, and that's one of the things I'm most proud of in Naked Politics, is that we really have just cut all that out. You know, we keep it simple. We talk to young people in a way in which they understand. You know, we create stuff that, that is reflective of them and, and their experiences. And, and we're not trying to make it difficult for them to understand. We want them to understand. So one of the things that's come out of this, the Black Lives Matter movement, which I know many of us find a bit distasteful, but I have to ask you, all lives matter. Where do you stand on that? I mean, right. All Lives Matter is one of those things that's highly insidious, right? Because it's, it's on the face of it, of course, it's a very reasonable thing to say. And it's completely true. All lives do matter. Of course they do. Um, however, to say that is to basically completely throw under the bus any real conversations around systemic racism and anti-blackness in particular. You know, our criminal justice system, we can see that white lives matter because white people are treated better, for example. Whereas black people are not. You know, black people are stopped and searched at a far higher rate. You know, uh, black people, you know, face a much harsher overall criminal justice system experience. And that's just one element of where your, your life is harder as a black person, right? You know, it comes into your dating life. It comes into your, your job, your employment, health. health, all kinds of things. Right. So in reality, black lives are, are, do not matter according to the, the, the structural systems that we have. That's why it's so important to say black lives matter. Um, because we know that they matter, but we want the, the systems that we live in and occupy to, to show that too. So to say things like all lives matter is highly insidious and is racist <laughs> because you are choosing to deliberately ignore the fact that black lives are not treated as though they matter. I kind of call it whitewashing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when all of this happened, as we know, George Floyd was murdered and before that Breonna Taylor and there was all you know that suddenly it took off this year how did that urgency and this whole movement affect the work you were already doing because you're already on that journey yeah. has it how has it impacted what you were doing with with naked politics and just more generally as a writer and a kind of social justice warrior can I say <laughs> big words um yeah so I think in terms of what we we're doing with naked politics we were already talking about race and, and racism, but it, it definitely, as the kind of leader of that organization, it made me realize that we had to make sure that we were really putting these issues on the agenda. And since then, we've made a really big commitment to make sure that we are talking about these issues. We're not just talking to our young black followers, but we're also telling our young white followers, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to be doing. Um, and, you know, we, we put up a post for Black History Month that said, you know, every month is Black History Month. Because for Naked Politics now, we're going to be talking about these things every month, not just October. So there's kind of no change of schedule for us. It's, it's usual business, right? Um, so that's kind of how things have changed with the website. Um, also, we're trying to recruit an advisory board at the moment. And I want to make sure, again, that that advisory board is reflective of the, 
the broad spectrum of youth. Um, so we don't just want, you know, the stereotypical young person that we imagine, which is, you know, a young middle class white person that, you know, eats avocados or whatever, <laughs> or gets a frappuccino. Like we want to have the broad spectrum of youth, which includes many young black people. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing with the website in terms of how this, this big moment has changed things for us. For me personally, it's made me realise the immense importance that allyship is. I was going to come on to that, yes, because you mentioned sort of reaching out not only obviously to people from, say, should we say, our shared background, young people of African heritage or young black people, but white people. Yeah. How do white allies place themselves? Where is their agency? Exactly. And, and that for me was the biggest thing because actually black people talk about racism all the time and we're expected to talk about racism all the time. And I was like, well, where are the white voices in this? Or to be fair, where are just the non-black voices in this as well? Um, for me, that, that's kind of become the linchpin of all of this is getting people who actually have that racial power and who have more racial power than, than us, whiteness carries more power than what we have, yeah. to use that power to actually change the status quo and change the system. And that's kind of what a lot of my writing has, has been predicated on since, is really exploring this, this issue of, of allyship. How do we be an ally in a way that's actually useful rather than performative? Because there were many people who were great at performing allyship um, and putting up a hashtag, but ultimately made no real changes. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, one of the things I take away is that Black Lives Matter cannot just be a hashtag. It's got to be a movement for black lives. Absolutely. And so, I mean, if you were to be speaking to white allies, do you think there's a difference between a white ally who is of your age group, say, and maybe one of my age group, somebody who's probably occupying a space that has more power in the sense of, you know, a lot of MPs and senior people are at 50 plus, whereas younger people don't have those positions of power, but they tend to be the movers and the shakers or the influencers. Do you think there's a difference in where that sits? I think there is an intergenerational difference. And I do think that younger white people are much more open to the idea that, you know, that everybody on some level is racist, for example, and that therefore the starting point is not, am I racist or am I not? But what can I do to combat the racism that already lives inside me? So I think, yeah, there is definitely an intergenerational gap. I think for many older people, a lot of these concepts are extremely alien and it's probably a lot more difficult to get them on board. Um, but having said that as well, I don't want to be complacent because progress doesn't just happen because, you know, young people come to the fore and, and, and they make the world better. Like, as much as I love young people and support young people, we need to make sure that it happens. Like, it's not, an, for me, this kind of progress is not an inevitability. Um, we all, all have a responsibility. Absolutely. So young people give me hope. Absolutely. Um, young people will always give me hope, um, but they also need the, the, the tools and to, to make this a, a movement for real change. We can't imagine that it will simply just happen because young people will one day take over. So where do you see things going? We're in 2020. Where do you want to see this whole situation going? And what role do you see yourself having in the future? <sighs> That's a really great question, to be honest. For me, I want to see structural change. I don't just want to see people read a book about racism and then it lives on their shelf forever and they never look at it again. I want people <laughs> to think about, you know, take those ideas that you've read about and think about how you can apply that to your workplace. Ask questions. Ask why are there no senior black staff here? Why are there no black judges, for example, or very, very few? Why are there so few black MPs, for example? You know, ask questions of, of your workplace and use that power that you have as a white person or collective power that white people can also have. Um, to really make good on that promise of, of allyship. You know, I want to see structural change. I don't just want to see people buy, buy a few books and then get bored of them. I don't want to see BLM just be a, a trend, which then kind of goes away and, and then people care about something else. I want there to be real, tangible, structural change. But that requires an understanding that as individuals, we're not going to achieve much, but together we can achieve an awful lot. So it's also making a huge mental cultural jump away from individualism and more to this idea of collectivism and the idea that actually we can achieve an awful lot together. I think when it comes to movements, people think a lot about individuals. We think about Martin Luther King, we think of Malcolm X, and yes, those men were great men, but ultimately movements are built on people working together, not on individuals who happen to be amazing. And yourself, 
you've spoken about the sort of structural change. Where do you see yourself in the kind of systemic or structural change? Do you, do you see yourself sort of writing more, maybe creating other, other spaces? Yeah, I think I'll always be a writer. That'll always be my thing. Um, and I'll continue to write. because Is there a book in you? Oh, God, I don't know if I'm that good a writer to write a whole book. Um, but I'll definitely continue writing, obviously, because that's, that's the medium through which I can express myself the best. Um, and I want to make sure that I continue to use Naked Politics as a vehicle to educate, to empower, create spaces, welcome spaces for young black people um, and to teach young white people or young non-black people um, more about these issues as well. And yeah, I, I hope I can do maybe what sometimes the generation before me was a bit afraid to do, which I think this generation of black people are less afraid to do, which is to challenge as well, which is to be like, actually, no, this isn't good enough. I'm not just going to kind of take this. Like, I'm going to say, like, I'm going to ask questions of organisations I go into. And if I don't see any senior black staff, I'm going to ask the awkward questions, um, which is something that I think maybe the, the generation before, for really good reasons, would have been quite afraid to ask. Um, so that's what I hope that I do. I hope I take this, this attitude with me, this newfound attitude um, and proudness in this and, and use that wherever I go. So you've shared so much of what you're doing. Thank you so much for that. And I'm just wondering, out of all the positive things that you're doing and the work that you're doing and the messages that you've shared with me and with the audience, is there one key thing that you think you want to get across one more time, the point that you want to make that people should take away from, what, from who you are and what you're doing and how they maybe can also do something positive around race and social issues? Yeah, my, my one takeaway really is, is do it. Don't be afraid to look silly. Don't be afraid that you're going to do the wrong thing. Inevitably, as an ally, you sometimes will, and black people will probably tell you <laughs> if it's wrong. But just do it, because the, the worst thing you can do is just not say anything at all. The worst thing you can do is just sit back and be like, oh, well, I'll just sit on the sidelines and hopefully things will improve. There's no neutral ground. There's no, I'm, I'm not a racist, but I'm not going to actually do anything. There's actually no middle ground that doesn't exist. When you do nothing, you are upholding the status quo. So my advice to people is get stuck in and do it. So you were saying earlier that as a, you know, one of the messages that you wanted to take away from this is that people shouldn't only kind of read books and put it on the shelf and let it get dusty. But you are a writer yeah. and clearly you've read a lot. Yeah. Could you recommend some books that people can start with at least? Definitely. And, and, and I do, it is good to reiterate, like people should still do the reading. Like I'm not being dismissive of, of the wonderful literature that is, is out there. And fundamentally, if I'm honest, I do think many white people do need educating in racism. You know, even as, as a black person who has a lived experience of racism, like the book still helped me to sort of join the dots and the bigger picture and understand things. And so the reading is, is still important, but we just shouldn't sort of stop short of it. Um, one of the most interesting books that I have read is The Superior Race, um, which is looking at race science, something that I wasn't particularly aware of, this idea that race is actually... Pseudoscientific. Completely made up. Yeah, it doesn't which, exist. Which, when I learned about it, <laughs> shocked me, because actually I've thought so rigidly like most people in terms of, of race, right? And actually race is something completely made up. There's no sort of biological oh, yeah. um, founding of it. Um, so it's a really fantastic book that really goes through and, and, and breaks down those, those ideas and, and really makes you realise how highly constructed racism is. It's not something natural and innate. Many people say, oh, you know, it's just a natural thing. You know, but it's also about power structures, how power can, can create something and make us believe it. Abs absolutely. And make, makes you think it's the truth and there's nothing in it whatsoever. Um, so it's a really, really fantastic, really thorough book. Um, that's really, really fantastic at uh, exploring the, the mythology around that and how that kind of pseudoscientific view is then used to, to justify, you know, the, in, the huge injustices that black people and people of colour in general also face. Um, so I would certainly recommend that. Um, I would also um, recommend probably Akala's Natives. Um, again, that's a really good book. It's probably something many people have, have, have heard of. I would also say for just to throw in that for, for my generation and for generations of white people, some of the books by younger people is, are, are, are excellent because we learn a lot about things that we don't experience because we're older and we're kind of past it. So yeah. I found that with personally with Akala's Natives. Yeah, because he's got his is very much kind of like 80s and 90s, isn't it? So he's got that quite 
unique. Um, but also he was experiencing that as a child where I was already an adult. So it's interesting. Yeah, really interesting. So I like the way in which he discusses the kind of intersectionality of class and race, mm -hmm. which is something really important to consider. Like race is not, you know, racism doesn't operate in a vacuum. It operates amongst many other power structures, um, which can also kind of mix together um, depending on, on, on your background, for example. Um, and then the other book that I think is really fantastic, it's really funny, um, which people are not expecting in a book about racism, um, but there's a book called uh, Think Like a White Man, um, which is by, I think, Nels Abbey. Um, it's tongue in cheek. Um, essentially, it's a, it's a book about how to navigate the corporate professional world as a black person. It's exceptionally funny, but in its funniness, it also demonstrates an awful lot of truth that's actually quite poignant about the masks that we wear, um, it, particularly in the kind of professional workplace. Um, you know, all the hair straightening and the, you know, getting rid of any slang and trying to sound as kind of professional as possible and all that stuff. So it's a really, really interesting insight, I think. Funny, but very interesting insight into the, the masks that we wear in the workplace as black people and how, you know, we need to try and use that sometimes to our benefit. Did you read Rennie Edo Lodge's book? I did, yeah. I thought it was a bit too lazy for me to recommend that because, like, that is the book. Um, it's a fantastic book. Um, and it really, I remember reading that and just thinking, oh, my God, she's nailed it. <laughs> like, she's nailed the experience of particularly British racism. British racism 101, maybe that's what we could call that. Absolutely. <laughs> because, you know, British racism, it is, a, it is different to American racism. I think that's a really key point. In the sense that it's it's much more sophisticated, it's far more subtle. You don't realise till several days after it's happened that you've experienced something racist. Um, it's not quite as brash as the kind of American style. Um, so yeah, she is absolutely fantastic, um, and it's again an extremely thorough exploration of of racism in in Britain, and it kind of very neatly ties together a lot of the kind of recent events around you know the rise of Trumpism. Um, Brexit and, and, and pulling all these threads together with a, with a real racial an analysis. And it's sad, you know, it's sad that she felt like she had to write a book saying this is no longer why I, I can talk to white people about racism because she was so exhausted with having to explain something that to her was so basic. Um, so it's it, fantastic as well, yeah, brilliant book. Great, so your recommendations, I'm sure, are going to have a massive impact just in themselves. I hope so. <laughs> thank you. Well, I want to thank you so much for that. T to end on that call to action. No, don't just sit there, do it. And thank you for sharing your time. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. And I have to say, I've learned quite a bit from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.